And you know, it, sometimes you do say that good morning, and, and you know that this, this morning we gather with a sense of grief, but what God wants us to have with the blessings and victory that Jesus has over death, who's having a great morning, is Richard. And he would want, if he could say something to us, he'd want to express the joy and the promise and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. But welcome to this service as we remember Richard, but thank God for the blessings and promises we have in Christ Jesus now and forever. We'd like everybody to join. Our opening song is hymn number 744, and hymnals are in your, in the, right in front of you, Amazing Grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This was the name God put upon Richard in holy baptism. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We say goodbye to a brother in faith until we meet inside heaven's gates, who is blessed in life, blessed with a loving wife, children, grandchildren, and many friends. We seek light and direction on this day. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus, give us light today because it is dark. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When we face death, we look to the one who has conquered death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. 
and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Lord, give us faith and strengthen our feeble limbs. Remind us that we have been adopted as children of God by the grace of the cross. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. I have two scripture readings, and the very first one is this 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We hear now a song, very familiar, How Great Thou Art, by Daniel DeCosta. sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I walk, Sing sweetly in the trees When I look down From lofty mountain grandeur And feel the brook And feel the gentle breeze Then sings my song sings my soul, my Savior, unto thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation, and take me home what joy shall fill my heart and i shall bow in humble sings my soul, my Savior, unto thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art.
hear these words from John chapter 11, the Gospel of St. John. Would you rise for the Gospel of Jesus? Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And after he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. But Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. But when Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe you that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, notice how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Please be seated. We sing our next hymn, The Old Rugged Cross.
grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you know, I, the, so many thoughts run through your mind on days like this, you know, um, memories. I'm just thinking about just different things. Um, you know, I was talking earlier, and I was mentioning I don't have a problem doing funerals. Actually, I sort of like doing funerals, especially when I know the person and I know where they're at. You know, I said the only time I really don't like doing funerals is when mom is sitting right there. That means, you know, mom is saying goodbye to one of their kids and then then funerals are very hard and then and that's that's a very difficult thing so do you know Richard I remember the first time I went to your house brought him communion a couple of months ago and told me all the, all the things that was going on and you know I left your house you were at work invigorated you know what boy was he up and energized and and you know all these health things going on but he had this incredible sense of energy and optimism and he had faith you know he knew what he knew who he was and he knew his medical situation it was pretty pretty bleak but you know he ultimately knew where he was going he had a really strong faith a very powerful and, you know, sometimes, you know, I get ministered to when I go in those, some of those situations because he had this faith that, that looked and saw, you know, he was in God's hands even in all the, all the issues that was going on. So, do you know what? You know, one, one thing I, he had a good sense of patience. And, you know, I think it becomes, you know, he, he was a master gardener. Do you know if you're planting things in the ground, do you know what you have to be? Patient. Because if you're planting things in the ground, things don't happen immediately. You know, a lot of times when you do something, you like to see immediate results. But you know what, if you're a gardener and growing something, putting a seed in the ground, not much happens immediately. You need to be thinking long term. It's, it's not a short, quick solution. It's something that happens over time. And, and you know, and, and a master gardener. You know, that's, that's one thing I definitely am not. I don't have a green thumb. I don't have a black thumb. I guess I have a white thumb. I'm sort of neutral. I've, I've planted some things that have come out good in my life, and sometimes other things have not done that well. I'm not... I wish he, he taught a class here at church as, as gardening and a master gardener. That's, that interests me. That's something I would be interested in because I sort of like growing things. And I grew up up north in Michigan, and the first couple of churches were in the Chicago area, and growing things up there is very different than growing things here down in Florida. And he had to adjust growing things in Colorado with sort of a dry climate, cold winters, and here in Florida all of a sudden we're tropical wet hot did you know it's humid here in florida you guys are all probably aware of that and the, the changes and all that goes on but talking to richard he had patience and i think that's one of the ingredients if you're going to be a master gardener you have to be thinking long term we don't always think long term. I know people in today's world, I know the younger generation, they sort of grown, have grown up with cell phones and instant, you ask a question, you know, you just, you Google it. And Richard and I weren't of the generation, we didn't grow up Googling everything. You sort of wait and see how things happen. Do you know, it's interesting. I think Jesus had a lot of patience. You know that gospel reading that I read? Long, long, what, 36, 37 verses I think I read. It's, it's, it's a long account. And Jesus is a couple days away, and he gets message that, you know, your friend Lazarus, he's really, really sick. Come, come and make him better. And what does Jesus do? 
He just hangs out for a couple more days. Jesus is patient. In his plans, in his ministry, he's patient. And then he says, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go see Lazarus. And the disciples are saying, well, you know, remember last time we were in Judea, they were trying to kill you. And then he said, you know, he had to tell us, spell it out for him that, you know what, Lazarus died. We're going to go back there. And I'm going to wake him up. Do you know, they come back in, and that's a great passage. They come back in. They come back, and they get there, and there's a funeral going on. And there's a lot of wailing, a lot of tears. And Lazarus, you know, we don't know the exact age, but it's sort of they're, they're contemporaries of Jesus. Jesus spent a lot of time at Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house. I, I imagine them all being right around 30-something, you know. They're young people. And you know what? That's a funeral where mom might have been there, too. Hard. Difficult. Martha runs out and says, Jesus, oh, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, he will rise. And he said, I know on the last day, but you know, whatever you ask God, that, that's going to happen. And then Martha had this great explanation of faith. You know, I know you are the promised one, the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into this world. You know, that's the great explanation of faith that when I talked to Richard, when I prayed with him in the hospital and all the, all the things that were going on, you know, he had that, that rock-solid faith in everything that was going on. And then finally Mary comes. And she's in tears. And the, those gathered around her. And, you know, then we have the shortest verse of the scriptures... Jesus wept. I know sometimes I make kids, youth, memorize Bible verses. I can, can you memorize this one? Jesus wept. It, it doesn't take too long to memorize it. It's, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, just two words. But it is the most powerful thing. And it gives the reality of the pain that death brings. Even though Jesus knows what's going to happen, do you know what? Losing somebody you love, grief is painful. It's not easy. It's not simple. And then Jesus wept. Do you know, I didn't read the rest of the chapter going on, but I think most of you know what happened, you know, if, if you read on in John chapter 11. They go to the tomb, and Jesus says, roll away the stone. And the people there who were in the cemetery said, he's been in there for four days. And you know what after four days a body starts doing that's not embalmed? It stinks. It's, the smell is terrible. You don't want to do that. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then he came out, wrapped in sort of the grave bandages. They would put sort of perfumes and oils on the body so you could visit the body for a couple of days, but usually the fourth day, it's, it's, it's well past what you can cover up. And Lazarus rose from the grave. Do you know, every time Jesus came across somebody who had just died in the scriptures, Jesus changed. Did it with a widow who lost her only son coming out of the town of Nain. Did it for parents who had a little girl who they said, Jesus, you've got to come. But before he got there, she died. And he did it with Lazarus here in John chapter 11. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. And then the disciples said, you know, Jesus waited for a reason and a purpose. 
He wants us to put our faith upon him. He wanted his disciples to know in no in uncertain terms, don't be afraid of anything, not even death. Because Jesus has power even over that. And Lisa, that's what, you know, Jesus wants you to know. You know, Richard in faith, he talked to, you know, so great faith in all the things that were going on. Um, and I did tell you, one of the times I visited him at the hospital near the end, you know, he said, I'm getting tired. I think I'm ready to go home. Not to Colorado. Although you guys lived in Colorado most of your life. But home is with Jesus. The place that he prepares. That he called Richard to. And that's a great blessing. Do you know the one thing is, God wants all of us, you know, for every one of us, you know, death is on the horizon. Some of you may be closer. Some of you may be years and years away. But it's on the horizon for every one of us. And, you know, the one thing God wants us to do is have, have that sense of faith and looking through it. Do you know the great passage of Scripture that looks through life and through death is that 23rd Psalm, very commonly used at events and services like these, because it talks about life, you know, green pastures, quiet waters, your soul is restored, paths of righteousness. And then where do you go? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you know, I've been, I think God wants us as we face this, because of the victory of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and what he does for us on the cross, you know, that hymn we sang, you know, the old rugged cross, it reminds us, you know, we, we stand 100% in the grace of Jesus, what he does for us on the cross. Not what we can do or have ever done, it's what Jesus did and shares with us. Think of death as a shadow. We're not afraid of your shadow, are you? I know some kids who are. Wait, that's, that's, you know, at first, you know, just thinking about it. You're not afraid of a shadow. And I think, and I, and I think this, you know, I've always loved this story, and it was, goes back when I was a kid. My first job ever was a paper boy back in Michigan. And, you know, you get up early in the morning, you're right, pedaling your bike around the neighborhood, flipping papers on people's porches. And, do you know, one of the things you get, you get most scared of, you know, when you're all alone at dark and as, you know, as a middle schooler, I think I started in sixth grade, and you worry about dogs. And I remember hearing the story, and it sort of resonated with me because I spent a lot of dark mornings out. Sometimes in January, it's miserably cold in Michigan in January. But it's about a paper boy in the morning. He had two neighborhoods that were separated, you know, but there was a, a dirt path to get to one. Otherwise, you had to go out to the main road, cut across about a quarter mile, and then to the other neighborhood. He had some houses in one neighborhood, some in the others, but there was a dirt path connecting him, made it faster. He'd drive through there in the daytime, but you know what? He was afraid because, you know what? In that dirt path, there lived this big, old, gnarly, old, wild dog. Some of the neighborhood people would throw him food, but it lived in this sort of dark little woods. The woods was only about 150 feet long, but it divided the two neighborhoods. But one day he was late, and his mom said, if you're ever late to school, you know, you can't have the paper out. And he said, I, to drive around to get to the other neighborhood, I'm never going to make it. So he said, I'm going to go through that dark path, and I'm going to pedal as fast as I can, and if that dog chases me, I'm going to outrun it. He went pedaling his bike as fast as he could through this path and he was almost to the end and said I made it 
And then at the last minute, the dog ran alongside him and clomped, clomped his jaws on his ankle, and he let a wild scream, ah! He skidded to a stop, and the dog still had his jaws on his ankle. But then he realized something. It didn't hurt. He looked down. The dog had his jaws on his ankle, and he looked at the dog, and you know what the dog had? No teeth. He shook his leg and yelled at the dog, and the dog ran away. And then he pedaled on, and he was thinking, you know what, the thing I've been most afraid of in my life is that dog, and you know what that dog doesn't have? Teeth. Do you know sometimes the things we're most afraid of? Death. In Jesus, it has no teeth. He wants us to see it as a valley of darkness, a shadow. But Jesus is with us. Today in spirit. But he's with Richard in person. Face to face. And you know then that 23rd Psalm ends, you know. The Lord prepares the table before me in the presence of all my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. The other thing, thinking about Richard, Master Gardener, do you know what the crops, they have the trees, they get their fruit all season, you know? Um, I'm fascinated by that, you know? Maybe the, the soil, I think, is better in heaven, you know? And there's no frost, and it's a little bit like Florida. But that's what God has planned. And that's where Richard is. In Jesus' name. Amen. Does anyone want to share something about it? You know, I, anyone here at church was, was anyone in his gardening class? Can you tell me about it? So. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, uh, I had the pleasure of knowing Richard. My name is Tom Proshel. I'm a member here at Emmanuel. Uh, gosh, I think the, I, I was only able to make one of the classes, uh, but there was probably, I would say, 10 people there. Uh, and he also had another some folks from the uh, extension office, part of Hillsborough County, and uh, he took great pride in teaching. Just trying to exp you know teach everybody you can grow something if you if you want to. It's not a, an impossible task. Even though I can tell you, I have grown tried to grow a lot of tomatoes and just never been able to pull it off. It seems, but uh, but he was he was uh, really enthusiastic about that program. And had plans to do this, you know, once a month. I think for many months. Um, and then we had, I think, a little hiccup along the way, maybe. And I, then his his health kind of got in the way a bit. But uh, but a master gardener, it's a it's a long program. I think it took him over a year to achieve it. Uh, it's run by the county. It's highly re uh, uh, recognized. And uh, he certainly came out with a very green thumb and a great love of teaching others about uh, what gardening can do. And it, you're right, Pastor. The patience is a big part of it. Uh, but boy, I tell you, when you see what you can grow and to see that final product, it's so rewarding. And uh, kind of like, you know, the, the first time that Richard and Lisa came into our church and I had a chance to meet them. And over the last year or so, two years, on and off, depending on everybody's health, it was always a, a joy to see Richard and Lisa at church with us here. So uh, while I will miss him, uh, I have some fond memories, and uh, I'm really thankful that you both uh, are here or came here. Pastor? Anyone else want to share a little something about Richard? And Do you know, I, I know a lot of the family, 
Do you know, and the one good thing is they all came in in the last month from out of state, you know, and, and that's sometimes better to be there when the person's still alive, you know, and, and getting in and spending all the time with his kids and, and, and doing that. So, and that made him very happy getting to see all the family coming in before everything like this, because now you don't really get to see him and, and, and doing that. So, interesting. The, Growing in God's blessings coming. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, with those walking with you to the tomb of Lazarus, knew the pain and the separation and the grief that you shared, even in the death of your friend, Lazarus, and that especially his sisters shared. And we pray for Lisa and Lord, give comfort to her. Give comfort to kids and grandkids. And remind us that your plans are forever. Your gifts and your blessings are forever. We thank you. We pray for comfort and peace to the family. And Lord, give every one of us patience. I know that's one of the fruits of the Spirit that sometimes I wonder if I have. For some things I can wait and other things I want things right, right away. Lord, remind us that Every promise you make, every word that has been spoken by you will be fulfilled. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the blessings and the grace of Jesus who takes our sins upon himself, who gives life, life eternal, life in your presence. Today, and forevermore. We pray for each other. Help us, comfort us. And Lord, for all those who grieve and mourn, remind us of the blessings and words of Jesus, who cries for us, who died for us, and rose again. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, and we pray together the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now sing hymn 677 for all the saints, verses 1, 2, 4, and 7.
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Everyone is invited to a luncheon. Um, it's served. You go out that way, you turn right, and then it's the first door on your left. So, and God's blessings and, and my.